to the 415ers podcast brought to you by the Odyssey Sports Podcast Network on 95.7 The Game. Mark Grandy, follow him on social at Mark Grandy. Mark with a C, Grandy with an I. Uh, Evan Giddings, you can follow me on social at eGiddings10, at 415ers across all social media platforms. Download, rate, subscribe, five stars are appreciated. Okay, Mark, yesterday we did see at the end of season press conference... <laughs> The yin and the yang of the front office, right? We <laughs> saw John Lynch, who is all smiles, a Stanford man, and and, and the the face in many ways of the, the culture and the brand and the organization in San Francisco. We also saw Kyle Shanahan, and, and in my opinion, peak Kyle. We saw that feistiness and frustration from another you know, season that comes to an end prematurely in his mind, even though he has been to three of the last four NFC title games, two of which ending in losses. But of course the 49ers will not be targeting, according to Kyle Shanahan, a veteran, a veteran starting quarterback this off season with the news of Tom Brady earlier in the day coming down about his retirement. Were you still, I guess, surprised to hear that there was no hint of looking outside the quarterback room. I was a little surprised. Now, look, I think they will go and sign someone. It's just uh, it, it'll not likely be a starting caliber quarterback. Uh, again, it seems that they're super confident in, in Brock Purdy's uh, timeline to return to play and, and be good to go for the start of the regular season. And I think they're totally confident with Brock Purdy as their team's starting quarterback. And, uh, you know, I think they're okay with Trey Lance as a backup. Uh, but you're not going into a season with just two quarterbacks. So them saying they're not targeting a veteran quarterback, you have to include the, the veteran starting quarterback in there because that, that's what they said. They're probably going to go out and sign someone uh, t- to be a, a backup or a third-string quarterback, but they're, they're not going to target someone that, that they think would start for them week one. Of course, things can change, and this Niners quarterback situation is <laughs> ever-evolving. Um I am not surprised necessarily that they they came out and and said what they said, um, because what else are they going to say? And and they don't want to hurt, you know, anyone inside their locker room. Uh, But I I do think that there is a a very realistic scenario that plays out where the Niners, at the very least, Evan, they feel a little uncomfortable with their quarterback situation and they feel like they might need to do something. Now, whether or not they act on that or not, or perhaps they just wait for Brock Purdy to come back, I don't know. But I do feel like, I'll put it this way, the Niners made it seem like their quarterback situation was, you know, all rainbows and sunshine. It was is great, no issues. But they have a rookie seventh-round quarterback with a torn UCL, and they have a third-year quarterback who hasn't played much at all, who they traded three first-round picks for, who just had double, two procedures on his ankle. That is not a good quarterback situation. Any way you slice it, there's a very real possibility that that Brock Purdy is fine, and he, and he has a full training camp, and he plays week one. But right now, Evan, in a vacuum, this is a really bad quarterback situation. There would be few teams that would trade for this quarterback situation right now. Again, things can work out, and they could be fine by the time the regular season starts. But this is not the quarterback situation the Niners would want to be in. And they made it seem like it's it's all perfectly fine at this point. That, that gets my mind working, Mark, racing, so to speak. And it does create a, a hypothetical question that I, I, I think you would enjoy. I think the listeners would enjoy as well, as well as the viewers on YouTube. Um, which quarterback room would you rather have? The 2020 in in pending 2023 quarterback room as it stands right now, or the quarterback room coming off of the 2019 Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> so coming off the 2019 Super Bowl, Jimmy yep. Garoppolo had his best year of his career, but did. ultimately didn't do much in the postseason. He did, and no. uh, did not not and. <laughs> <laughs> Not really his fault the first two games, considering the Niners just ran the hell out of the ball. And they didn't, didn't let him leave. attack, Mark. They didn't right. unleash Jimmy Garoppolo. You're right. And then he didn't have the best Super Bowl, uh, yeah. of course, missing Emmanuel Sanders, which will go down as one of the most painful plays in Niners okay, history. Well, all right. I actually, all right. I understand that play and why people are so frustrated with it. To me, 
The more damning throw of that game, maybe this is revisionist history, but it always bothers me because I do hear that play brought up all the time for the 2019 Super Bowl. And, and this isn't about you as much as it's about 49ers fans. To me, the most damning play of that game for Jimmy Garoppolo was not overthrowing Emmanuel Sanders, but it was throwing the ball with his eyes closed on the final drive of the fourth <laughs> quarter. That, to me tells me that the quarterback is not ready for the moment as opposed to overthrow. Like we saw Jalen Hurts miss AJ Brown on a go route. That would have been an easy seven points at, in the NFC championship game. Anytime you throw the ball with your eyes closed, I don't want you on the field as a quarterback. That's just me. And I, I apologize for kind of steering this in a different direction to uh, either confirm or deny. If that was a worse mistake, I would have to go in and rewatch. And I'll be honest with you. I have not rewatched that Super Bowl, and I don't really ever plan on doing that. I'll so go back I, and report. So I will plead ignorance or I will just accept your answer. Uh, Jimmy, that was the worst throw of the Super Bowl. How could you? Um, I don't know, Evan, you if you it's really difficult to forget everything that's happened since then. But if you were to be able to travel back in time just after the Super Bowl and ask me, uh, and still knowing everything we know about Brock Purdy and Trey Lance, but not what has happened with Jimmy Garoppolo over the season since, I might take 2019, as, as crazy as that sounds, because you have a quarterback who's healthy, who's coming off of a season where he was fully healthy, who's coming off his career best season, and remember, you you could have thought in the moment that that was the worst, the, the bad decision, the wrong decision, but they chose Jimmy Garoppolo over Tom Brady that offseason. The Niners, I think, certainly would take that 2019 quarterback situation over this one. And if if Trey Lance and Brock Purdy were, were fully healthy, um, I, I might change my decision there. But considering the fact that both of them have injuries right now, I, I think I got to go with Jimmy Garoppolo at the end of the 2019 season. Yeah, I'm with you because to me it comes down to stability. But I also do believe that the question depends mostly on how much you believe in Trey Lance. Because yeah. optimistically, Brock Purdy will be back in six months or you know close to 100% in six months. If he is not, and I think there's a greater chance of that than it sounds like Mark does. But regardless... Trey Lance might be forced into action at some point this season. And, and the way that quarterbacks have played out in San Francisco, odds are better than none that he will have to do so. So at some point, it does appear that Trey Lance is going to get a, a shot to start for the 49ers. At least that's how, how I see things playing out. If you believe that Trey Lance is maybe not the guy, but can be serviceable, can take care of the football, can be a cog in the machine that Kyle Shanahan has created on offense and now has Christian McCaffrey, who he didn't get to play with this last year, then I understand maybe you saying, all right, the 2023 upcoming quarterback room gives you more confidence than the one from 2019 because you believe in the upside of Trey Lance and Brock Purdy as opposed to what you saw from Jimmy Garoppolo, especially like you mentioned in that postseason run. But I myself am one to err on the side of security. And coming off that that Super Bowl, there was nothing more secure in a lot of people's minds than Jimmy Garoppolo and the 49ers' chance to get back to the Super Bowl in 2020, which, of course, didn't happen. So I, I'm with you on which room I'd take. But, I mean, the question to me is going to come down to which Trey Lance walks into OTAs. Because, again, he no matter what happens to Brock Purdy, whether it's six months, whether it's 12 months or longer – Trey Lance is going to have the leg up come OTAs because he is going to be healthy. He is going to have first crack at at least impressing the rest of the team, the rest of the staff before Brock Purdy returns to the fold whenever that happens. Yeah, I mean, uh, regardless of what happens with uh, Brock Purdy's recovery, Evan, if it is six months, if it is, is longer, regardless, Trey Lance has a huge opportunity this offseason. He's going to be the only quarterback that can work out for the 49ers, you know, they can work, work out at all that is under contract for the 49ers, assuming that they don't go and get any starting caliber quarterback uh, all off season until training camp starts. He's going to be the only, you know, major guy competing in OTAs, all levels of OTAs. He's going to be the only guy that can hit the field with Brandon Ayuk for much of the off season with, with Debo Samuel, with, with Juwan Jennings, with anyone, with George Kittle, if he wants to. I know Kittle does a lot of his his offseason training, I think, in, in Tennessee. Yeah. 
Um, but well, I'm last sure. year there was a lot of reports that Brandon Ayuk and Trey Lance had created yeah. great chemistry in the offseason. So, I mean, this is an opportunity for Trey Lance to get better, prove himself to his teammates, prove himself to his coaching staff. And even if Brock Purdy is back for the start of training camp, perhaps those six months where Brock Purdy was unable to work out with his teammates while while Trey Lance was, Evan, perhaps we see a shift in how the Niners evaluate their two quarterbacks. So this is a huge opportunity for Trey Lance, regardless of Brock Purdy's timeline. Trey Lance has a fantastic opportunity to, again, kind of change the the narrative around his game and his career and how Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch and the rest of the Niners feel about him because he has a six-month head start this offseason. And if he wants to get his career back on track, Evan, if he doesn't want to be supplanted by a seventh round Mr. Irrelevant quarterback who was drafted two years after him, he has to have a fantastic six months. Not saying I think it's going to happen, but these six months are incredibly important for Trey Lance. Yeah, they're important to restore, you know, whatever balance was there, whatever confidence was there prior to this season. And, you know, by by all accounts, it wasn't just you know the the injury. I think that or the the way that he was used that gave people, you know, sort of pause. But um, I also think that, I mean, Trey Lance right now is in, is in a fragile place in his career. I mean, it's his going on his third season. He's got one more year left on his rookie deal, and if he wants to have a chance to play, like he needs to prove it in practice, in the offseason, and in the places where, frankly, Kyle Shanahan demands you to be as close to 100% as possible. Like, that's the reason why Brock Purdy beat out Nate Sudfeld is because of what he did on the practice field, because of what he did in the offseason, not because of, you know, his preseason performances So, or, or the few opportunities he was given. Like, Brock Purdy came in, did the work as much as anybody else, but then showed Kyle Shanahan he was ready for the job if the job came to him, which it eventually did. Um, and I also know that there's some other things you wanted to, to touch on from the press conference before we, we switch gears more. Yeah, really good point about Purdy and Sudfeld. Um, I know we got to get to D'Amico Ryans in a second, but one other thing I observed from the, the press conference between uh, Lance and Shanahan, Evan, is just the dynamic between the two. I know we, we touched on it uh, just yeah, a little Lynch. bit. Lynch and Shanahan. Oh, yeah, Lynch and Shanahan. Yeah. My bad. Uh, so at one point, Lynch was asked, because there's been rumors about him going to television, and the last year Amazon executives approached him. He was asked, do you feel like you're going to be the, the general manager this coming season? And, and here's how Lynch answered that. I, I think so. You, you good, Kyle? <laughs> I, I, no, I, I, I plan on being here. I really do. And and uh, I'm, I'm committed to doing this, and I'm, I'm having a great time doing it. And, uh, you know, committed to finding a way to get a little bit better. Uh, I'm real proud of what we were able to do this year. Uh, that's hard to say because our our expectations and our standards were to win the whole thing. So John Lynch asked if he'll be the general manager this coming season. The first thing he does, I know it was kind of in jest and he was joking and laughing. The first thing he does is turn to his head coach and say, we good? As if Kyle Shanahan has the power to kick him out or to fire him or to to you know, talk to superiors and say, hey, I'm done with John Lynch. Uh, that's not how most general manager head coach relationships go. That was just one look into their relationship, Evan. There was countless other questions asked about personnel, asked about coaches, asked about anything. Guess who immediately jumped in to answer every single one of those questions? Kyle Shanahan, the head coach, not the general manager, John Lynch. I know we joke a lot about how Kyle Shanahan is really the general manager and the head coach. Um, but if you need any proof of how much power Kyle Shanahan has and perhaps the power he holds over John Lynch, just go back and watch that press conference because he handles just about every question that every other general manager would across the NFL. Well, number one, John Lynch, how many cliches can you fit into a sentence? Like, it's honestly <laughs> impressive. Like, that, again, that's how you know this guy played in the NFL because he has answered. I would imagine he would he has used those answers for about 17,000 different press conferences, uh. media appearances, speeches. Like, that's why John Lynch is in many ways the face of the front office more than actually being the brain of the front office. And that, to me, is what you're talking about of what we saw right there. You saw the face identify with the brain 
And throughout the entire <laughs> press conference, it was just a back and forth, a ping pong between oh, yeah. what is, um, you know, publicly going to be stated and then what more so is actually going on between John Lynch and Kyle Shannon. But I also think that's why the relationship works really well because there's a mutual understanding of the power dynamic within that building and both are comfortable with it and both are comfortable with each other. I don't think we've ever seen any form of tension, at least publicly between the two sides. And it sounds like behind closed doors, they work in a fashion that is good for both. And the reason why John Lynch feels comfortable saying, yeah, I'll be back. I, I love being a part of this organization. I have no problem with taking less or more off of my plate and taking less work to go do TV, which by the way, he's very good at. Yes. And, also being willing to work with a guy like Kyle Shanahan, who, as I'm sure people have, um, you know, observed his his chippiness in press conferences. Well, how do you think he's like behind ho closed doors? I mean, there there is uh, an Instagram live video this week of impending free agent and safety, Jimmy Ward, yep. who came out and talked about how Kyle Shanahan essentially gave him an ultimatum when he switched positions earlier this year. And remember, we talked about that, Mark, and how this is kind of the cutthroat business of football. Well, Kyle Shanahan evidently asked Jimmy Ward, essentially, would you rather play the, the slot corner position? Would you rather be our nickel guy? Or would you rather ride the bench? That is the Kyle Shanahan that is responsible for 13 wins this year, as well as also the Kyle Shanahan that's responsible for being the brain. Yeah, well said. I, I'm mostly poking fun. There is a lot of truth to it. We're probably overstating it just a little bit. It's yeah. probably more of a 50-50 split. Uh, maybe close to it. I don't know. You kind of get the sense. Are you doing your John Lynch right now, Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm trying my best. Uh, <laughs> you kind of get the sense when you hear people talk about it, that it is, it's all Kyle Shanahan. I, I, I'm sure John Lynch has a gigantic voice in that front office, but Kyle, there's no doubt Kyle Shanahan certainly has more responsibilities than, than most head coaches that don't in their contract, uh, have it stipulated that they have full roster control. So uh, yes, it is interesting. It, it's always fun to, to kind of see how that relationship works. And we got a we got a peek into it on Wednesday. That we did.